We have lots more fabulous content for you. But, and I'm so pleased to announce this as our next speaker, is the wonderful Emeritus Professor of Medicine, Laurie Balin. Now, Laurie, as you will have heard already this morning, has been involved in the REN study for many, many, many years, has been responsible for major advances in understanding the role of diet and lifestyle in high blood pressure and cardiovascular disease. And much of that work has been done in collaboration with the RAIN study. So Laurie's going to reminisce on his 25 years with the RAIN study. I look forward to hearing you speak, Laurie. Please have Thank you very much, Romola, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And I'd like also to acknowledge the original owners of this land, which we uh, gratefully share. Well, I, I put this slide up, and it's the only slide that I'm showing, because it's the sort of slide that does make me reminisce and meditate. And I took it at about 6 o'clock in the morning at Matilda Bay, when there's that beautiful light and beautiful tranquility. And uh, much of my memories are, are express the feeling that's in that slide. But of course, remember that by midday, the Fremantle doctor comes in <laughs> and the waves come up and you have, to, you have to adjust, you have to trim your sails if you're a, a salesperson. Well, I think if I, if I had to sum up, and there are different ways of summing up the RAIN study over the last 25 years or so, it's, it's a matter of teamwork, uh, determination, uh, certainly persistence, and collaboration, and vision. And the vision, we've all heard about how it started, and that's wonderful. But in searching back through the archives of my memory, of course, the first thing that comes up are some fascinating anecdotes about some of the wonderful people involved. So I tried a couple of these on my wife, Brenda, and she said, don't, she said. <laughs> she, she said, don't. They're rather defamatory and you might be sued for libel. I want to hear them. <laughs> but uh, maybe over a glass of wine sometime. With <laughs> Okay, so what am I going to... I'm going to talk about a bit of why and how I became involved. And then I'll talk... Uh, a bit about the evolution of the RAIN people, and closely tied with that, I will talk about the, we'll discuss, the, the, the reminisce about the RAIN family, all of you here. Now, how did I, as a physician, or now retired physician, don't like the word retired, as a, as a former physician in adult internal medicine based at the Royal Perth Hospital, uh, become involved in, in the RAIN? Well, I was always interested particularly in the prevention of disease, and hence the management of hypertension that causes high blood pressure, and as you've heard, all the related disorders with it, overweight, diabetes, lipid problems, and so on and so forth. And much of my research, in fact, was in the form of the last uh, 40 years of randomized controlled trials of getting people, asking people if they would be prepared to change their lifestyle, and let's see what actually happens so that the advice that could be given to the general public was based on firm evidence rather than congesture. But, of course, I was stimulated to do that because so many of the patients I was seeing, even sometimes from their 20s, 30s, and certainly by their 40s, were already overweight. They already had high blood pressure. Some of them had diabetes. A lot of them were stressed and depressed. And you could see all these things interacting. And this didn't suddenly happen at the age of 45 or 50. It had been a, a, a lifelong event. And there was a lot of evidence, certainly from early childhood, that obesity was a, a lifelong problem. So even before the RAIN study was started by the, the terrible four, of whom three are here, um, with my colleague, the late Bob Van Dongen, a wonderful person, uh, and some other colleagues and PhD students, we'd ha we had correct, uh, conducted randomized controlled trials 
in a range of schools in Perth in 10 to 11 year olds and 14 year olds, about 2,000 of them, to see whether nutrition and physical activity programs in the schools and boosted by their parents would actually reduce the rate of uh, overweight and reduce the tendency to blood pressure rises and, sh and shown some positive effects. So that was, uh, that was an early part of it. But I'd heard of the brain because I was not only colleague but close friends of, of uh, the wonderful people uh, you know who I'm talking about who'd already set up this great randomized controlled trial. But the next I heard of it was when my wife, Brenda, started disappearing down south or into the gold fields for a few days at a time. And she told me that it was because she was working for Siona Stanley, picking up those people who'd already entered the cohort, but you know, uh, uncompromisingly had uh, disappeared off into the bush. Well, that's what Brenda said she was doing, and I, and I did believe her. <laughs> <laughs> she always came back sort of flushed with a smile on her face. <laughs> Never seen her so happy. <laughs> A couple of years later, John, John, terrible laughing at your own jokes. <laughs> John asked me if I would co-supervise a PhD student, uh, Kevin Black from Ireland, to see if brain data could confirm the inverse relationship that had been reported by Barker between, um, in particular this, this time, between birth weight, low birth weight and higher blood pressure. And uh, I, I jumped at that opportunity, and we've, uh, John and I and many others, have been collaborators since then. And since then, I've been involved with, as, as you've heard, a, a whole range of PhD students, wonderful people, and fellow researchers, fellow researchers and have many new collaborations. So that, that, that was really how, how it began, well, how I began in it. Uh, I was primed to, to get into it by what I saw with the patients and some of my family even uh, in relation to their lifestyle. So let's talk a little bit about the evolution of the brain and it ties in with the evolution of science and the changes in the people involved. We've both been evolving. evolving. So Shakespeare, in his famous speech, um, you know, all the world's a stage and so on and so forth, talks about the seven stages of man, starting with the mewling, puking infant in its mother's arms. Some of that will bring back memories to you, with the infant working through childhood, then to the adolescent lover, then to the soldier, and I hope we don't have to have too many of those, the judge, then to the pantaloon, which I think is a character that I fit into, and then the age that we all eventually get to and uh, pass on from. But Shakespeare has something to answer for because he, he missed out two important things. First of all, there was no stage of life of pregnancy as far as Shakespeare was concerned. He presumed he, you know, that was just for women. You can take that as you like it, if you like. Um, and the second thing he, he missed out on was dis actually describing any stages, stages of life for women. You know, they were, what were they doing in Shakespeare's life? Well, we know a lot from his plays. They were, they were doing a lot, but he didn't consider them worthy of talking about in this wonderful uh, play, as you, as you Like It. So Rain, of course, has included pregnancy in great detail, and it's, it's one of its greatest strengths its ability to relate what happens in pregnancy to what happens in later, later life. And Rain, of course, has, has both uh, uh, at least two of the sexes in it. Um, although, as a researcher, uh, I and my colleagues often have to battle uh, with very powerful statisticians to convince them that there are at least two, well, that there are two sexes and, and at least two genders. Um, and they are very powerful, and, and they are concerned about statistical power. And they say, if you pull the population, you'll have much more power to identify whatever you're trying to identify. That's true, but then you lose the opportunity to identify uh, important differences between male and female development, behavior, genetics, and, and the rest of it. And you'll see that some of the slides, even from from our group uh, have combined the tech sexes for those reasons. In the scientific literature on populations and clinical trials, the same thing happens. 
but there is now an, up, an upswell to actually make sure you do look at men and women differently, and I think that's of vital importance. Well, scientific knowledge is evolving, and it's fascinating to see how this, the RAIN study has evolved along the same time. There are always new questions to be asked, and there are always new techniques to help answer them. And part of the evolution of the RAIN has been the wider and wider circle of investigators who've been involved. I mean, it started out with just people who were working at University of Western Australia, um, the Children's Hospital, King Edward, Associated Institutes, and the Royal Perth Hospital, increasingly. Um, that's changed now, and all the universities, all the hospitals, all the community across Perth is involved, but people internationally. Roshan, who came over from Melbourne for this meeting, just one example. That's a good example of the importance of face-to-face -face meetings, because just before COVID, I was giving a talk on the RAIN study in Melbourne at a cardiovascular meeting. In the tea break, I was chatting with Roshan's supervisor, Jun Jing, a wonderful endocrinologist, and she was telling me how the RAIN could help throw light on this common but undiagnosed condition, primary aldosteronism, which is a major problem with a lot of people with high blood pressure. So those face-to-face -face meetings are, are so important. Okay, Zooms get us together around the world, but they don't substitute for the sort of communication you get when you're chatting face-to-face -face very informally. The management and organization of the RAIN, and I'll look at Romola and Becker, but there are many others, of course, has evolved tremendously. Now, you'll find all the details on the website. And <laughs> on the surface, it's a very dry subject, but it's absolutely critical. It's been absolutely critical for the rain to survive and thrive. And of course, it's required an enormous amount of leadership and an enormous amount of hard work, unpaid hard work, voluntary hard work by many of the people here. So I, I just want to emphasize that. Don't underestimate it because it's not presented at a scientific meeting. Now, some reflection on the Rain family heroes. Uh, and this is where you, really all of you come in, but particularly the Rain Gen 0, 1, 2, and 3. Some of you here from the inception of it and some of you from conception. So, um, you know. So from the very outset, when you were first invited to take part in a randomized controlled trial, which wasn't just going to look at potential benefits, but potential harm to your delicate, new, you know, not yet born infant, you were asked to take part. And, and what did you say? And I think it was really heroic. You said, yes. Right. Now, yes is a word that we've discovered is some people find very difficult to express. And then again, of course, when you were asked to take part in the long-term follow-up, you just had a baby, some of you were feeling depressed, most of you were feeling relieved that the baby was out, but it was a very sensitive time of life. And again, when asked to take part in something that you didn't know would grow for the next 30 years infinitely, again, you said yes. And when you were asked to keep up with the science, for example, by having blood samples taken at eight years old, and this was organized by our PhD student, Ray Chi Huang, uh, into a, what seemed to be an inordinately large syringe, <laughs> uh, you as parents uh, said yes, and I guess your children have never forgiven you for it. <laughs> when the girls were asked to come back to have their ovaries scanned for uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, to have many sensitive questions asked, you said yes. When the boys were asked in early teenage years if they had the balls to provide sperm, <laughs> what did they say? I guess they, they said yes, and I'm told with considerable enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> well, it goes on. And I <laughs> it goes on. <laughs> <laughs> life, life goes on. 
Okay, but it does go on with complicated studies like sleep studies going into that enormous rattling machine, the MRI scanner, which is quite claustrophobic for some, uh, agreeing to record linkage, which involves very sensitive data, having blood taken for DNA, again, very sensitive. Again, all of these things you said yes to, and uh, then you became parts of the experimental process yourself in, in the sense of designing, helping to design the studies. So enormous contribution. So what does that all mean, all that yesing? Well, it reflects an enormous level of trust an enormous level of trust in the whole RAIN outfit and in the RAIN, RAIN researchers and in your university ethics committee. That's so important. And equally important is that in this era, in this era of falsehoods and conspiracy theories, you realize that health and health care will only advance by excellent research providing the evidence. So that trust and that commitment and that understanding of the importance of research has been absolutely important, absolutely fundamental. Right, just a few words about, I can see Romola looking at her watch, don't worry about that. <laughs> um, you took a risk asking me to reminisce of 25 years, 10, 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes they gave me. The, the researchers and PhD students, in a sense, you're, you're the composers of the music of the rain. You know, what questions do you ask and how do you try to answer them? And that's the fundamental reason that the RAIN study has continued as a cohort. It has the potential to provide so much. And then because of the complexity of the data, special interest groups were set up, which was good, and I'm glad to see that they're now amalgamating some of them because some of the dangers, one of the dangers of having special interest groups is that they do tend to become silos. But fortunately, there is a lot, has been a lot of cross-collaboration between the existing groups. Even more important, I think, has been, been bringing in people quite outside the RAIN group, quite outside traditional health and medical research, who have completely different ideas. And the sort of, that's the sort of input that's likely to propel the RAIN forward and to perhaps enable it to really lead to paradigm shifts in our understanding. We can't afford to, to sit still in, in any sense. One of the uh, special pleasures that I always have at, at these meetings and, and others is seeing how PhD students develop and mature and eventually, I mean even at the start they're our mentors, but they become our, our, our really become our mentors and, and, and uh, advisors. But seeing a PhD student first present their work on the national stage and then on the international stage and to see how they realize well, gosh, my work in little old Perth really stands up to or leads to work anywhere, the quality of work anywhere in the world. That's a wonderful thing to see. And all of those who you are still PhD students or have been, I, I think, need to understand that. This is really world-class work that we're talking about. Then uh, just another group of unsung heroes, which we've heard about, of course, are the staff of the RAIN study, the recruiters, the measurers, the data recorders, the curators, the managers of all this activity, over 3,000 people coming back year after year with their children, and you have an enormous task to make sure this data is collected accurately, the measurements are reproducible, uh, and that you can feed them out to the researchers and get them back and keep the whole system going. You are the frontline face of the RAIN study, and you always have to be welcoming, which you always are. You always have to be smiling, even when you may not feel you want to smile, and yet you have. So whatever the pressure, you also are truly heroes of the RAIN study. So getting near the end. So has the RAIN study always been plain sailing? Well, I think as my opening remarks about the Fremantle doctor, well, of course not. I mean, it wouldn't be real life if it were all plain sailing. Um, and learning how to overcome the problems has been part of the growth of the RAIN, if you like. It's certainly a challenge. And as we all know, in every walk of life, you only need one or two disruptive personalities, they're fortunately rare, 
but they can be so time consuming and so emotionally draining. But the RAIN organization, from my memories over the last 25 years, has always managed to work through these issues. And I think that's to its great credit. And the last thing that does continually weigh on the minds of researchers, and something said about it, has been said about it here, is, is funding issues. That really is an enormous headache for everybody involved. It, it involves us at every level of the foundation. Um, and I think it's, it's of such great credit to the whole RAIN enterprise that it's not only survived, but thrived despite those pressures, and they are ongoing pressures, I can assure you. Um, you know, my heart almost bleeds for some of the researchers who spend months devising applications for the National Health and Medical Research Council, which will enable a recall, and now they have a one in seven chance of getting a grant up. It's like a, a cross between a, a lottery and a game park. So, <laughs> so coming back to the very positive aspects of, of the RAIN, it does survive, it does thrive, it's going to go from strength to strength. And if I had to, again, just summarize my memories of 25 years in a nutshell, well, it's all been a wonderful experience. It really has for all its many, many ups and the occasional down. And it really has been such a privilege for me to work with such wonderful people over such a very long period of my life. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> Can we have more stories? Because if those were the polite ones, I <laughs> hate to think what the rude ones were. Uh, Any questions? I don't. Go on, John. <laughs> John's got one for you. Hi, John. Well, I, I'd just like to say on behalf of everybody here how much I enjoyed your talk, and I'm sure everybody would agree we're very pleased to see you enjoyed it as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a so, very so, good, I must remember that line, John. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, I've never seen anybody enjoy their talk as much as you have. So, 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 Laurie, at the end of the day, not that this is the end of the day, but as the sea breeze is coming in and then mm. fading, of all your 40 years of internationally acclaimed research mm. on hypertension, mm. what has been your greatest achievement? I think uh, probably helping to train other people to think. Yeah. Okay. And for that we all say thank you, Laura. Okay. Thank you so much.